All right, so another boring week with the U.S. markets closing flat. Psych! Yeah, it was a busy week. Despite closing flat, U.S. markets went on a ride this week with so many headlines. The S&P was down as much as 5.5% on intraday trading on Monday, but the index battled back with the net effect of all headlines apparently cancelling out. A busy week for earnings saw a lot of big names shake the markets, including Tesla, Microsoft, and Apple, which we'll discuss shortly. In total, 133 members of the S&P 500 reported this week, keeping investors on their toes. Internationally, shares got smacked around a little bit in the face of ongoing economic and geopolitical concerns. Oil continued its triumphant march upwards, with the world's second largest producer poised for war. Gold and silver prices fell sharply as a strong fourth quarter US GDP print and a hawkish Fed helped the old greenback, to the detriment of more ancient stores of value. The sector returns for the S&P 500 looked a bit more balanced compared to last week. Yeesh, that was one to forget. Oil companies are clearly getting lifted by the underlying value of the commodity, and if you saw this chart, you might be tricked into thinking that tech has been a fun place to be lately, but the picture is a bit less pretty on a monthly basis. Top moves on the S&P 500 were pretty significant this week, and as you can see here, we're heavily driven by one of two things, earnings and energy. Okay, so getting into earnings, Tesla had what I believe to be a very strong quarter, but someone needs to tell the market that. Revenue beat by 6.5%, along with EPS beating by 7.4%. Revenue growth from the quarter was up an incredible 71% on the year. Also, Tesla now likely leads its competitors in operating margin, but, you know, it's their numbers, so who knows. And vehicle growth continues to significantly outpace its competitors. My only concern here is who the hell puts a graph title at the bottom? Elon's clearly gone mad with power. Total unit production was up 82.5%, but it's got to be said that the higher end Model S's and Model X's seem to have hit their peak. Perhaps this is a sign that Elon's goal of making Tesla cars for the average person is paying off, or it could just be that rich people are early adopters and tapped out. Anyway, despite the decent quarter, that was enough to hold up the big time valuation. By close the following day, shares were down nearly 12%, bringing the cumulative pain to the year for investors to 29%. Tesla's lofty valuation did shares no favors here, but it is worth pointing out that on a multiple basis, the company is trading at its lowest level since the initial COVID lockdown. Another beat for the company. Shocker. These guys manage the street expectations like, I don't know, whatever the opposite of the Zoom is. I think many of us thought the talk would mostly be about the Activision Blizzard deal they just announced, but instead it seemed like all eyes are on the Azure cloud computing business. As you can see, Azure's been the big growth engine for the company, as increasingly more and more of our lives get put on the cloud, even stuff that has no place being there. The 46% growth figure was in line with street expectations, but didn't really beat, and came in below the 50% growth mark for the first time in a while. As a result, the stock took a bit of a hit in the aftermarket before trading up nicely following the management call that walked analysts off the edge and presented some decent guidance. Apple had another solid quarter, beating top and bottom handily. Revenue reached its highest level ever, driven by beats in every segment except for iPads. Tim Cook appears to have properly managed street expectations after some very cautionary statements in October about chip shortages likely taking off around $6 billion in revenue for the quarter. The company doesn't really give out much for quarterly guidance, but it did highlight that, assuming the COVID situation doesn't get any worse, they expect to post a record March quarter, which is a tall order. In 2021, they launched a new iPhone in September, but in 2020, it was launched in late October. So presumably, there's going to be a lot less new phone spillover into this quarter for their highest selling product line. Investors obviously like that, with the stock up 7% in trading the following day. Mama told me if I didn't have anything nice to say, then not to say anything. So in that vein, I'll be brief. Revenue sucked. The guidance sucked, the user base declined, and everyone seems to hate them. And while the collapse ain't pretty and the share price is a third of what it was at its IPO and more than 80% from its peak, it's still important to note that the company trades at a pretty significant multiple for what can only be considered a mature market with plenty of competition. On Thursday, the US Bureau of Economic Analysis published a figure of 6.9% GDP growth in the fourth quarter. Gargantuan. Smashing the analyst survey of 5.5%, Concerns that U.S. economic growth was going to get sidelined from inflation and Omicron seem to have been misplaced. Or have they? A look under the hood a bit at the breakdown shows that a whopping 4.9% of that 6.9% came from inventory building, and obviously much less from increases in consumer buying. Businesses know their customers best, so if they're aggressive on inventory, it could be a good indication that the U.S. consumer is healthy, and that without this Omicron blip, which is hopefully only temporary, would remain on a good footing. However, how much of this stocking is associated with supply chain issues, such as rebuilding depleted stocks, or businesses trying to build up inventory in the event of future issues, is, well, who knows. Next. 
Bridging over to the U.S. Federal Reserve, Jay Powell and the gang met again this week on Wednesday. The man with the keys to the printing press, or login details, cast a bit of a warning that growth was slowing in the early part of the year. Not too shocking given the modest lockdown conditions. The tone, however, built on their increasing concern over the persistence of inflation. Where we were using terms like transitory a month ago, the world seems to have settled into the idea that inflation is here to stay. Traders interpreted this very hawkishly, and the curve, particularly the short end, sold off aggressively. In the Q&A, Powell went on to say that not only is inflation high, but there is a reasonable chance we could see it get even higher. So, following GDP data that was strong, albeit a bit opaque, and an Omicron situation that seems to be improving, things are looking launch ready for that March rate hike. The street seems to more or less agree. The poll the banks take on their estimates for rate hikes has more than doubled the probability of a March rate hike over the course of January, with several analysts of the mind that the Fed could pull a double hike, i.e. 50 basis points instead of the standard 25 beeps, and lift rates from the 0 to 0.25 band by half a percent. Additionally, since the meeting, the total number of estimated rate hikes over the course of the year has increased from around 4 to around 5. At this point, I think we need something shocking, like say a land war in Europe, for the Fed to not pull the trigger in March. Also, last week I put together a video on the Fed situation, so click the link above if you think that might be helpful. Moving on. Breaking up is hard to do, especially if you're the most indebted property manager on the planet. Following recent easing moves aimed at supporting mortgage lending in the country, Evergrande followed up this week by stating that it intends to treat all bondholders, both onshore and offshore, equally, which has been a point of concern to international investors worried about getting railroaded in the restructuring process. In a proposal submitted to Beijing on Wednesday, a new plan would see the company's property management and EV business, read as the non-junk bits, kept within the company, while China Sinda Asset Management, a state-owned bad debt manager and an Evergrande creditor, would take over any of the unsold property, aka the junk bits. This would fit nicely with the company's stated plan for a six-month restructuring behind the scenes in order to avoid any undue negative attention on the real estate space. If this does actually happen, it could go a long way to stabilizing the beleaguered property market in China and supporting the integrity of their financial markets. That said, it's still unclear what would happen to banks and bondholders under this arrangement. If they're presumably made close to whole on their investments, that could lend credence to the idea that investors shouldn't be wary of the heavy hand of the Chinese Politburo. But like, if they're forced to take massive haircuts on their investment just to have everything shipped neatly into a state-owned entity on the cheap, well, let's just say they aren't going to be getting too many Christmas cards this year from bondholders. Alright, so that's all I got. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed it, please give it a like and maybe even consider subscribing. I'm Ryan, and thanks for tuning into Market Lab.